Welcome. I'm so glad all of you could make it tonight. My name is Tracy Guaman, and I have been affiliated with Groves Academy for the last 14 years. I've been working in the upper school and recently have um, turned over, and now I work in the Groves post-secondary program, which you'll hear a little bit more about tonight. I'd like to welcome you all for coming. Um, we have water and snacks here to the side. Help yourself. There are bathrooms located right outside the hallway back here. If you need to use that, feel free to to uh, go back and forth through that door there. It'll be open, so you're not going to be making any noise in our program. Um, we have a couple of different presenters tonight. Um, the first is uh, Mike Pierzak from LDA, and he is going to do the first part of the presentation. And then later, um, Josh and I will be talking a little bit more about post-secondary options. So, um, and, and Ron, I guess. So <laughs> again, thank you for coming. And I'll, I'll let Ron take you over and introduce himself. And Hi, this is a special part of the program. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my name's Ron Mahalik. I'm a Groves parent. Um, I also have a, uh, an ACT and an SAT test prep company called Breakaway where I work with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, over the past summer, I had the opportunity to be working in the school and talk to John Alexander, the head of school, about starting a program um, for kids with learning disabilities and attention disorders. And in October, we launched um, the first two classes, um, first two test prep classes for the ACT for kids with LD and ADHD. And they filled up in the first two weeks that, that we made the program available. Um, I just want to let this audience know that we are offering um, the same classes, and the classes are a six-week program. They meet twice a week after school on Mondays and Wednesdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays. They meet for two hours and 15 minutes. Um, there is an hour of instruction. All instruction is provided by Groves instructors who are obviously familiar with and expert at working with kids with learning disabilities and attention disorders. They, um, they used the curriculum that was developed for my company, a company called Breakaway, which was designed um, in the past few years by former directors of education from the Princeton Review. Um, the materials have been proven with about five or 600 kids. They get results. Um, what the Groves teachers are able to do is to bring explicit instruction on some of the key concepts and some of the fundamentals that the students will need to be successful on the ACT. So. Um, I have a number of these brochures that I've uh, left with Josh. Actually, they're outside on the table. If you are interested, um, my contact information is on here. Um, the next class starts January 2nd. It starts immediately after the break. Um, and that's the Monday, Wednesday class. The Tuesday, Thursday starts on January 3rd. And they meet for the six weeks that lead right up to the February 11th ACT administration. If your student you know if your student qualifies for accommodations on the exam. Um, Groves is a test center, and um, if they're approved for accommodations, you can have them approved to take um, the test here as well. Our teachers are great working with the students and uh, do everything that they can to stretch those accommodations to make your students feel as comfortable as possible. So, um, so if you're interested, love to hear from you. Thank you for this paid commercial announcement. <laughs> Enjoy the show. <laughs> Well, good evening. Um, can I give you some background? I work for LDA Minnesota. Has anyone heard of LDA Minnesota? Learning Disability Association of Minnesota. It's been, it's been in Minnesota for 40 years, think of that. And about 37 years ago, um, I graduated from St. Thomas College with this degree in history, and I, we weren't going to go in many places in history, so I went back to St. Thomas for lunch one afternoon, and there was a lady sitting in the cafeteria, and she said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I have a teaching license now in social studies history, but you know, 1973, there were many jobs, now in 2011, there aren't many either, but she <laughs> says, we're starting a new program here in special education, and we're getting a license, we've just been granted permission to give, uh, to award licenses to um, graduate students in the area of learning disabilities, which was interesting, because it was almost, the, if you think back, no one's as probably as old as me in this room, but if you think back to 1973-74, we were finally seeing a change in our culture and our society, that all children were going to be included within the educational process within our schools. And St. Thomas at that time, and the University of Minnesota, they started granting licenses in SLBP. Does anybody remember that back then? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Special learning behavior problems? 
So it was a combination of LD and children with kind of behavioral disorders. And so that's where it started. And um, over all of these years, I worked in different states and I've had different administrative roles in special ed. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is something a parent reminded me of in an IEP meeting. And this happened maybe a few years ago, and she said, and, I'll, and this maybe, I think this should have been all I said. She says, Mike, what do I do when the IEP goes away? Because for so many years, that IEP is really your communication document to the entitlements of your son or your daughter. So how many here students are on an IEP or their children? Wow. How many are growth spans? So then, <laughs> So that means I have to go through all these slides because we have all these parents on IEP. So here, what, here's the important thing, though, is, is that when you think of transition, and years ago transition was, well, we'll just get these kids um, job skills, job prep skills, some will go to college, some will go to technical school, and some will just get jobs. And I remember one, I was teaching um, SLBT in Circle Pines in about 1978, 79, or whatever that was. And one student said to me, Pearsack, I'm going to make more money than you. Why do you do this? And I said, well, John, how are you going to make money? Well, my father's a bricklayer, and I'm going to lay bricks. And I said, good for you, John. You're going to make a lot of money. And I bet he did. I bet John has made a lot of money laying bricks. But that was in 1978. And what, what was happening, even at that time, is a lot of the students that I was working with, they were following their parents into careers that were created in part because of their parents' efforts or their possibilities that were created. And so they had those access points. And then just last year, a couple years ago, I was a principal in St. Paul's schools, and you saw those opportunities not there anymore. You really saw where you had to really cultivate the potential of the individual student to try to make it after the IMT goes away. So anyways, that's the background. So here, now, they said I don't have a clicker, so we're just have to follow this. You have the handout, and for the most part, um, we'll go through this. And this is how I'm conceptualizing, if I was a parent who had a, a son or daughter in school who really understands that at a certain point in time, whether it's a graduation at grade 12 or age 21, that IEP is going to go away. And then what? So this is kind of the... Um, the discussion we'll share with you this evening. The post-secondary education is the key. Whatever that looks like, whatever post-education looks like, that's what we need to channel our efforts to. So when you're sitting at an IEP meeting in transition, I'm going to give you ideas tonight of how to create discussion points at those meetings. Because this will work. You'll probably, is there, are there any administrators here? So <laughs> um, but this works. This is real. But I'm going to share with you really this work. So here are the statistics, and the employment population of persons with disability was 19.5% compared to 65% of the people with no disability. That was 2009. Its research has shown college graduates with LD have employment rates and earnings consistent with the U.S. workforce in general. Here's the beginning part. Here's these words. How many of your son or daughters are in transition planning already? And in Minnesota, Minnesota has that at age 14, some states, you know, that under IDEA 2004, you could kind of, kind of um, not really get into it until age 16. But Minnesota really has stayed consistent over the years. I think it's great that they really believe that we need to start these discussions around transition as early as 14 and make sure that those discussions are pretty significant in terms of how we're, we're preparing the young man or woman to leave school. Here's something, you have a handout on this um, that's separate. Has anyone ever been involved in futures planning? Or it's called mapping. Here's, this is what I would suggest. If you think of the five transitional areas, you all, most of you have been, or you will be at IEP meetings, but they'll talk about the five transitional areas. Those, in a sense, those are the areas. So the home living, the community care, rec, leisure, jobs, and education. Your, your IEP team now is required to work with you and with your son or daughter in addressing those five, five transition areas. 
the question we did is, is you know, schools will say, well, we're going to do assessments. We're going to do different.